commentary is very superficial and uh you know kevin knows china he was a young diplomat there in the late 80s and uh he's almost a native speaker yeah and so he's an almost native speaker and so to understand china you really need that depth of uh experience and knowledge and deep knowledge and uh, i think he has it Prague, remind me where you are you're in I actually am in Philadelphia. I'm based in Philadelphia, but I also have a place in Manhattan. So right now I'm at my apartment, like three blocks from the UN. Uh, and I go to India every six weeks. Uh, since COVID, I mean, it's, last year I still went four times. Um, and I just got back from there about four and a half weeks ago. And I probably won't go until the, the, the Delta four or whatever they are calling that variant from India is, is well under control. But, uh, Yes, I, I travel extensively. Last year, I flew almost 270,000 miles. I'm already 125 this year. You know, the global services is a wonderful thing. <laughs> well, actually, on the for-profit side, my clients are Carnival Cruise Lines. So while the whole industry is, is stagnant, we, we went on all these ships that are, that are not moving. And that's what I'm going to talk about, basically, opportunities that, that lie within COVID. Uh, and, and we went and retrofitted all these ships to bring them back to service with all these technologies that are going to uh, be paramount in, in, in them being able to sail again and, and bring a lot of confidence to their guests. So we were, we were in situations where you walk into a country and uh, for example, uh, Philippines is one of them. I landed in Philippines, I board the ship, I was supposed to be there two weeks and then Philippines goes under lockdown. So you can't get, you can't touch the land again. So the consequences were that we would have been stuck there for um, over two and a half months. But anytime they do these kind of things, there are always maritime clauses that kind of get you out of jail. So uh, I was ready to kind of private a jet for myself and fly myself from there to India. And then from India, take a commercial flight back to the U.S. Uh, because they won't let you in any other way. Uh, you have to kind of cocoon yourself. You get off the ship on a, on a private boat. You get onto a private car, get to an airport, and then fly a private aircraft out of there. That's the only way you can get in and out of a country that's under COVID lockdown. So twice I was I was uh, uh, a part of that, once in Italy and then once in the Philippines. But uh, it's great times that we're in. I guess we can get started now. Um, yeah, John. So uh, you know, some teachings, maybe a positive and a negative, and uh, try to keep it to five minutes. Yes, absolutely. So uh, I, I will kind of use my my uh, work uh, experience from last year to kind of bring insight into uh, what, what what COVID pandemic did to us. Uh, uh, basically, what what ended up happening is like everybody else, we were affected uh, pretty significantly. Uh, and what we did is we we kind of pivoted very quickly and said, look, immediately when 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 the virus hit couple of things happened. Everybody shut down. Everybody went into this mode of uh, remote six feet distance and new businesses started cropping up. You started seeing these signs that says, please stay six feet away. Yeah, the, the, you, you, you saw uh, Purell was running out of all the shelves and hand cleaners were like the big thing. Gloves, masks, face shields. Suddenly people that were able to pivot and cater to the need of the day uh, were thriving and, and, and prospering businesses, uh, individually packed meals. Uh, there were a lot of places that never closed, uh, even throughout COVID, because what they did is they went to uh, outdoor catering uh, or, or takeout uh, food and, and individually wrapped meals. So we kind of said, look, a, a virus or a pandemic is, is, is not a new event. It happens all the time. One of my largest clients is Carnival Cruise Lines and they owned about 60% of the world's cruising market. And all their ships all at once were completely just locked out, no more sailing. And they knew coming in that this is going to be uh, lasting for over a year. But we started putting our thinking hats on saying, hey, how do we find opportunities in these adversities? Uh, and how do you build something that is gonna last you past this pandemic? Because you, you had the, the rotavirus, the norovirus. I mean, there's all these viruses that come and ships get tremendous amount of negative publicity and they have to cut short their voyages when one of these things hit and they got to come back and refund the money and give you a brand new cruise and whatnot. Because they never had any systems in place that helped them deal with these sorts of events. Uh, so COVID became like a, a platform for us to build these systems and we did. We built 
by the way, we're the largest. If you look up, uh, the, the initiative is called uh, Ocean Medallion, uh, M-E-D-A-L-L-I-O-N, Ocean Medallion. And we are the largest Internet of Things project uh, anywhere in the world because what they have done is they've taken 17 of their ships and converted them into smart cities. Uh, so each one of these ships now has roughly 3,000 guests and 2,000 uh, crew members. So it's a city of 5,000 people. We, we Each one of these individuals now wears what we call a medallion. It's a, like a disc that you can wear as a necklace or clip it to your belt or wear it as a watch or whatever. And it's self-powered. You cannot turn it on or off. It has Bluetooth. It has NFC. It has oscilloscope. It has a gyroscope in it. And it, it detects your motions and movements throughout the ship. So at any given point, we know where you are. So one of the first technologies that we built out of that was contact tracing. Uh, the beautiful thing about this device is when you're off ship, there is no other technology, but these devices talk to each other. So if two individuals were within six feet of each other for five minutes and they come back to the ship and one of them tests positive, the doctor just presses a button and it gives them a list of every individual that was within, within five feet of this person for more than five minutes. Uh, so that's one piece of technology that now is going to uh, allow them to fight any virus, not just, not just COVID, in terms of contact tracing. We did automatic temperature ses uh, sensing solutions. Uh, so as you walk onto the ship, these technological devices that are all over the entrance and exit of the ship takes your temperature. If you are above a certain range, you get pulled out on the side and they can do an instant uh, rapid test on you to see if you're positive. Uh, we made some very creative solutions like hand washing systems. All over the ship, they have sinks, but majority of the time, people don't wash their hands. And we also put this on the Purell dispenser machines. Each time you go to that machine or to the sink and you clean your hands, we know about it. And then we incentivize you. We say that oh, we'll give you a drink free if you uh, wash or clean your hands before entering the, the, the cafeterias or the restaurants, because you are now cutting down the risk of transmission. Uh, so multiple of these technology solutions were created and in adversity, we found opportunities, right? And we capitalized on them. There's my five minutes. A question for you. These new systems have been provoked or inspired by COVID-19. Will you carry these new systems forward after we get through COVID? Absolutely. So when the CDC heard about these things, they were more excited than the guests will be or the cruise lines will be. Because what happens is from a regulatory or the framework perspective, when something like this happens, they never let it de-happen. Now you've already made the capital investment. You're going to use that perpetually going forward to enable. Uh, and I can go into some other details. Once you're quarantined, the minute you leave your room, which you're not supposed to, immediately we know. So, so we can send somebody to say, hey, you're not supposed to be out of quarantine. Please go back to your cabin. So um, some people think that this is spooky, but it's not spooky because the medallion is your room key. It's your passport and it's your credit card. You don't need anything else on or off the ship to transact, to get in and out of the ship or to open your cabin door. The minute you go up to your cabin, it automatically opens the door for you. You don't have to touch anything, nothing. The door's open. So how about another quick teaching, a second one? Well, so uh, like I said, in adversity, you find opportunities, right? That's the first teaching. The second teaching is any time where there is a problem and you create a solution, it should be a lasting solution. So everything we've built, we didn't just try to cater to COVID. We tried to cater to a, a virus because there, there will be another one, right? This one uh, is, is impacted purely. It, it, it spreads via uh, air and, and via your own germs. But there are a lot of other viruses that are, that are stomach-related viruses that are transmitted by your hands. So we paid a lot of attention to, to cleanliness and, and, and hygiene as well because a lot of those other viruses, uh, that's how they are transmitted, uh, by, by touching things, not so much by air. Uh, so, so when you try to fix a problem, make sure that it, it, it transcends not just your problem du jour, but also things that are to follow. So fantastic. So in adversity, we have opportunities for creating new solutions. Sanford, over to you. 
Uh, Sandy Kleiman in Los Angeles, and happy to see everyone. And it is a great pleasure to be at the Harasses Gathering again. Um, from my point of view, there's a lot of lessons. Um, I think the most important one for me is the fact that we need to instill in populations everywhere in the world the importance of education and critical thinking. At the end of the day, what we have seen during this, this period of time is not just the lack of organization around how to approach a pandemic, but the lack of organization being exacerbated in information, even in entertainment, in the media in general, because you actually have to have people who are well-educated, can understand when the science is imprecise, can listen with a level of critical thinking as to how to make decisions, and you need organization across the board that is well-intentioned, not political, is focused on public health and science as opposed to interests that have nothing to do with public health or science and have to do with other issues. And I think that we have seen social media um, distort how people interact with information and how they've also been confused in science by the sort of many voices that are not authoritative coming to them, but seem as if they are authoritative. And I think coming out of this, and I think this is true in general, is we have all the tools for how to improve that, and we need to apply them. Uh, the second, uh, I guess, observation and learning from it for me is that the pandemic forced um, a online world for education, as well as communication. And I think on the positive side, we learned to cope with the fact that, and we had the tools for being more isolated, but having tools that allowed us to communicate differently than we ever had. Where Cisco and John Chambers brought us telepresence a long time ago, and we've gradually moved into video conferencing, I think we've learned how to use these tools under the sort of compressed period of the pandemic in ways we never thought we did. I mean, a computer I am on with you now was not in my home at the time that the pandemic hit. And what I would say is that it forced a recalibration in my own mind about education. Is in the, in, in the agrarian, and this is an American perspective, you know, our educational system is based on an agrarian model where basically you needed people home on the farm to actually do the work that needed to be done at home. And people would go to school otherwise. And we have had an overemphasis on credentials. We have had an overemphasis on memorization, testing, the sort of repetition of facts as opposed to critical thinking. And what I think we have seen during this period of time is a crystallization of a couple of things. One is that in the right ways, lifelong education is the order of the day. And it's not just a pandemic issue. It's an issue that has to do with the rapid translation of our worlds into an online, offline, digitally enabled world. The second is that when I was growing up, um, if you had resources, you had the Encyclopedia Britannica to learn about the world or the world book. We actually bought our encyclopedia. We were quite poor. Uh, at the A&P grocery store, you know, letter by letter, week by week. Today, in cell phone or the tablet or the computer you have access to, if you have access to the Internet, you can read any book. You can, with your own curiosity, you can educate yourself in the liberal arts with the greatest thinkers in the world or just with people who assist you. And I think that what we have come out of this seeing is a further questioning of the traditional model of education and of the sort of, you know, degrees and other significant uh, landmarks that we had in education being at least supplanted by uh, new brands that bring quality information, that encourage curiosity, lifelong education, and bring certification rather than prestigious degrees. And I think in a world where Google says, just come to us and take our education, and Goldman Sachs saying you don't need an MBA, just let us train you. It's an acknowledgement of the fact that the hopefully that we are going to encourage much of the world to be in a dialogue about lifelong education and about their own curiosity never ending. 
Thank you very much, Sandy, for those very interesting comments. Uh, I'm the only person not based in America on this panel. Like I'm in Australia, as you know, but America, seen from this part of the world, is a country that is torn apart by divisions, by inequalities. Uh, it's a country that is polarised. And one of those inequalities is access to education and education performance. And the OECD, an organisation in Paris, has a, a study of uh, education worldwide, literacy, numeracy and scientific capacity. And the US doesn't do that well in that, uh, that rank. Is this critical assessment of America's education correct, according to you? And how can America improve its, uh, the quality of the education, if so? Are you asking me or are you asking the panel? Oh, you, of course. <laughs> You're the my, one I, my, my personal feeling is that um, we need to move from models that are basically inequitable because they have something to do with um, access to physical yeah. location, size of class, quality of resources available to you, to a world where we actually level the playing field for those that want mentorship, where we reinvent new tools for education, and where we actually, and this starts with the family. It starts at the family. It has to do with community. It has to do with friends. It has to do with religious institutions. We need to inculcate in people, in my opinion, both the, the, the desire for education and the sense of tools and understanding how to use them to get it. And also the sense, and I know this is going to sound, uh, I don't know how this will sound, but I think it's important. You need to convince young people that they can do it, is that they should not be discouraged, that they should not be pushed aside, that they should not, you know, I, every time someone says to me, you know, I can't learn math, I think to myself what Mike Milken would say, let me teach you. And I think that there is the sense of how we bring everyone along as if we were all a community together moving forward. That is the change from elite education from disproportionate, uh, you know, economic benefits to the sense that education is a community activity rather than a, a, a situation where we stratify people artificially. Uh, thank you very much. Andrew, over to you. Uh, yes, thank you very much, and thank you for your wonderful thoughts. Um, I'm in Los Angeles, and so I'll speak to more of the American kind of shift in terms of our culture and also our policy. Um, Americans, as you mentioned, there, there's a lot of divisiveness here. So we, we basically have had 9-11, the financial crisis, now the pandemic. And I, I do want to emphasize that there's going to be 600,000 dead from COVID in this country alone in the next week. So I, I share your optimism, but I'm much more guarded in mine. To describe this as past tense, I think, would be a, a lack of vigilance on part. But what I would like to, to discuss is a previous... Um, pandemic trauma that America had was the HIV AIDS crisis. And the cultural sentiment on that was that people who had the disease, it was their fault somehow. And at the beginning of the pandemic, you saw this, and you saw it expressed through the, the kind of debate over masks or not masks. But over time, um, a great benefit was that people sacrificed for the common good of other Americans. And that was a truly novel and unique thing that I'd never seen before. Um, was this idea that, yes, I, I will not go outside, I will suffer, I will endure mental health consequences, my relationship is eroding, but for the greater common good of my country, I will endure through this, we'll get through this together. So that, I think, was a huge benefit. And then that also translated to a shift in just Americans thinking of public health in general. And you saw these quirks, right? Like, you could get tested for free, but if you were found to have covid you could still go bankrupt if you had to go to the hospital, right? And like be inundated. So there's these stories of people who are going bankrupt from COVID treatment, um, but the actual test for COVID was free and then the vaccinations are now free. Uh, so it, it ushered in this shift at the level of high government and policy that healthcare can be a human right. Prior to that, it was deeply ingrained in the American psyche that you know, if you don't have health care, you deserve to die. Like We find this in our, our homeless crisis, right? You're homeless because you deserve it. So it's not a complete shift where it should be, but it, it was the ushering of a notion of public good and public health and also of internal sacrifice for the greater good and this notion of transforming our society that people who are suffering or in poverty, it's not a character trait, it's... Uh, you know, a cluster of factors, it's multiple systems working together. 
but that we as individuals can get through this and overcome together. And that, that to me is the great takeaway is that beginning of that transformation to a, a more kind of Western European idea of a social safety net for America, and also for this idea of the common good that, you know, public health is public and we are public together. Great. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. That's uh, interesting that uh, your perspective on America turning a little bit uh, European. Uh, uh, I don't know if the other speakers would agree with that. It's, uh, uh, I can see Parag uh, <laughs> twisting his nose. No, I, I think to a certain degree, uh, I, I agree with Andrew that I, the, the, the sense of uh, taking ownership of of making the situation better, you absolutely saw that. The, the county that I am in, in Pennsylvania, it's called Montgomery County. And if you look that up, uh, it was an, one of the epicenters of when the pandemic was going rampant here on the East Coast. And our county commissioner, who I know personally, uh, basically pleaded to people saying, look, we all can do this. Um, and before uh, the, the, the other people joined the panel, I said that I flown over a quarter million miles last year. I have been PCR tested 52 times now. Uh, I'm not talking about antigen, not the quick one, the one that goes right to your brain, to your sinuses. Uh, and and the, every time that I came back from my trip, uh, I, I quarantined myself here in my apartment in New York for four days. I got tested before I went home. And that's not only to protect my family, but to protect my, my staff members, to protect my neighbors, to protect everybody. So I, I, I agree with Andrew that, that that happened. I would have never done that before because it was all about my rat race and my time and, and me getting back to work as quickly as I could. So, uh, and I've seen this with majority of the people. I speak on, on my behalf because I'm sharing my experience, but I've seen this with so many, so many people. So absolutely. But, but I think... Uh, from a healthcare perspective, I, I, a lot has happened. I mean, uh, I, I know a lot of people, a lot of doctors that have provided services for free because people just couldn't afford it and they were going to die. My brother-in-law is an interventional radiologist and he never, in his private practice, he didn't even ask for any insurance papers. If you had a blood clot from COVID, he was treating you. If you can pay him, great. If you can't pay him, I mean, his mortgage was not uh, at risk. So he has, he has provided service to a lot of people. So uh, I, I think America has uh, done a lot of good for itself. And it's great to see that. I, I, I don't know whether I can agree that we're, we're headed towards Europe and becoming a, a, a socialist kind of a mindset country. I mean, we'll never be uh, a Switzerland or a Germany. You see what happened in Germany. They gave paychecks to people for eight and a half months, nine months, full paychecks. Uh, it, it, it's one of two things. Either you put $1,200 in people's pocket or say, I'm going to give you the paycheck and pay taxes and, and the cycle goes on. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know whether we're uh, anywhere near uh, being uh, of European mindset. I, I, would, I would say we are nowhere near being a European mindset. I mean, I think that what we've seen, crises in general and the pandemic being no exception, bring out the best and worst in people. And it brings out inconsistencies. So on the one hand, you have people who are altruistic and doing exactly what Parag has just talked about. You have, on the other hand, people who think wearing a mask is, you know, a political statement and, and a, frankly, an infringement on their rights. And I was having this conversation just in Beverly Hills the other night where it is illegal to smoke in a restaurant in Beverly Hills and many other places. Why? Because secondhand smoke is carcinogenic, and it infringes on your rights. So if you're in a restaurant sucking up, now you could say the restaurant owner should allow that, but from a public health point of view, we do not allow secondhand smoke in many locations because of the transmission of carcinogens from the smoker to the non-smoker. And yet, the transmission of a lethal virus from someone who has it to someone who doesn't, that is airborne, becomes it's inconsistent. I mean, it, you know, if you line one up against the other, it makes no sense that they should be looked at, in my opinion, that they should be looked at differently. And I think the political divide that we have in the U.S. is, is a challenge for the country, and we will see how it sorts out. I think that on the one hand, many people agree there should be a social net. On the other hand, we've also moved into a period of time where um, too many people um, have taken the position that the ends justify the means, winner take all, 
you know, the haves should have more and the have nots should have less. And then there's the other side of that equation that doesn't agree with that. And I think we're wrestling. It's, you know, it's almost biblical. We're sitting here wrestling with who we will be when we finally coalesce to some future evolution of a country we thought we knew. Yeah, well, I'll make a couple of quick comments from, my, from an Australian point of view. Now, Australia is a federal com- country like the US, like India. We have six states and two territories. And one of the very first things that our gov- national government did, which is a right-wing government, in March last year was to establish a national cabinet. And so <clears throat> the national cabinet is made up of the leaders of all of the states, territories, and the national government. And you have right-wing leaders, left-wing leaders, all there together. And there was a serious attempt to have a national strategy for dealing with COVID. And although there were differences and arguments and so on, it's actually worked pretty well. The nation has actually come together uh, knowing that we have a national problem and we must work together. And so that's been quite impressive. And I, for me, quite surprising that, that Australia could do such a thing. And the other thing which is quite striking in Australia is that all of our governments, national and state governments, have chief medical officers. Now, whenever our Prime Minister is giving a press conference on COVID, he has standing right next to him the chief medical officer. And whenever there's a technical question about COVID, he passes uh, the the microphone to the chief medical officer. So we have chief medical officers and political leaders working hand in glove. And obviously, the chief medical officers are trying to be friendly to the government, but the government is relying substantially on these chief medical officers and there's this you know, motto in Australia about following the science, following what the medicine and medical officers say. I think that is one of the reasons why Australia has done pretty well in managing the, the virus. And, of course, back in the days of Donald Trump, of course, you know, in America, at least seen from Australia, there's lots of squabbling between the states and Washington. And also Mr Fauci had a very difficult time. He was not always taken seriously by, by Mr Trump. So... That's one thing I'd like to point out about how we managed it at a political level. Quickly, uh, like Sam, I'm a professor in Tokyo, and I used to be an IT dinosaur. I had to hire an IT trainer, learn how to record my lectures, conduct classes on YouTube and Zoom and so on, and it's worked surprisingly well. So pointing to what Parag has been uh, talking about, I've actually adapted to this new situation in quite a positive way. So there's just a few comments from, uh, from an Australian perspective. What I, what I would say, just in short, is <clears throat> one of my favorite films is Apollo 13. And it's used to teach because it shows how when you need to handle a crisis, you come together and make under great time pressure and life and death circumstances critical decisions. Had we handled the pandemic with even a fraction mm-hmm. of how Apollo 13 Uh, handled bringing the astronauts back, that would have been better. Had Apollo 13 handled bringing the astronauts back the way we handle a pandemic, the astronauts would have perished in space. Stanford, adding to that, if I may, John, I mean, let's, uh, without being facetious here, uh, if every human on this planet quarantined for 14 days, what happens? Science says the virus goes away. Right. The the key is it's that simple. If every individual and let's say we take that 14 days a week extra and say genuinely every one of us is going to self quarantine for 21 days. This calamity is behind us. I'm not sure that that actually would have happened. No, what I'm saying is that's what the science says. That's exactly because the people that have caught it are going to to go down the course of death or recovery, whatever, whichever way it's going to fall. But the transmission of it immediately stops if everybody ends up doing that. Well, as we know, we yeah. all focus on independence over everything else. But, but uh, Parag, how do you get on in a country like India or the Philippines, the, the country of my wife, where you have 10 or 20 people living in a small house? But you that, know, that, so that is not possible. So, so what they have to do is they self-quarantine as a bubble and let the fallout happen there. You have, you have to think bigger outside because regardless of which country you're in, poor or rich, whatever your living conditions are, if you 
cocooned yourself for 14 or 21 days, whatever, whatever that number is, on, erring on the side of safety. If a family of 11, two people contract it, or maybe none of them contract it, even if 11 of them are living in a household, if they didn't expose themselves in India, I'll tell you what, what happened in India. The first wave actually was the poor people that caught it and the rich were kind of blaming them. In the second wave, it's a complete opposite of it. Because the rich were so complacent, the rich caught it. And when one family member catches it, they're giving it to five or six people that work for them, whether it's their gardener or their driver or their maid. And that's why it spread so quickly. And there's no denying to that. It's my my friends were partying like it was 1999. <clears throat> they, they, they didn't think there was a virus because it didn't affect them as a class, as a society. Andrew, we haven't heard from you for a while. Uh, yeah, the, the influence of the caste system into epidemiology is completely fascinating. I do think, um, to his point, if the American government, like certain countries did, just put money in everyone's bank account uh, and said, hey, don't worry about it, everyone just stay where you are for 14 days, America would have had a shot at this kind of thing. Um, but because we're, again, I don't, I'm not saying we're going to become Finland, but it was the ushering of this idea that people who lose their jobs, it's not their fault. This idea of taking calamity from the realm of the personal responsibility and place it in the public domain, which is a big cultural shift. And yeah, if the American government had said, hey, we're going to give you three months salary, just don't leave your houses, the pandemic wouldn't be nowhere near the 600,000 dead we're about to cross that threshold of. So yeah, I believe he's correct. And I believe it's also evidence of like why we're moving towards more of a social safety net and again, amongst all this tragedy, that's kind of the perk. And I, I don't see that perk going away. Also, the um, economic problems that led to the ascension of Donald Trump haven't gone away. Automation has now been increased because of the digitization of education and things like that. So that's actually creating more employment problems, which, again, the, the answer to if you want to have a economy of robust innovation and hardcore entrepreneurship, you have to ameliorate the, the shocks to the, the employment sector, to employ people. And I, I think that that will be the perk of the pandemic. This will be that tragedy that ushers in not a completely European system, but at least those types of things and those types of programs uh, to mitigate future calamity for us all. Let me return just to the thought of, of how you eradicate a pandemic. The sense uh, with, with, uh, with all deference to the sort of quarantining for 14 days, everyone on the planet, the, the practicality of that actually doesn't work. And I would, what I think is that we have a number of organizations, Milk, Mike, you know, the Milken Institute Faster Cures has just come out with a study on how you deal with future pandemics. Uh, Dr. Larry Brilliant, who was the one who eradicated smallpox and carried the last smallpox patient out of a hut in Africa's work on eradicating pandemics. We need to actually think about the protocols, which involve contact tracing, painstaking work, so that the world does not shut down, and yet we can actually corner a disease and, 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 and do what many countries did, make the right decisions in terms of health protocols, make the right decisions in terms of economic sustainability, make the right decisions in terms of the fact that people lead their lives day in and day out. And it's very complex, but it does need to be thought through. And frankly, um, there was a playbook in the United States that was ignored. Whether that playbook was complete, I don't want to comment on, but we do need a playbook. We need cooperation. We need people who actually are both well-meaning and have, as I say, the critical thinking to understand what is right and what is wrong, what is understood and what needs to be understood better. We need to be understanding of the fact that we don't have answers to everything, and we need to move forward in a way that is um, as, as in an environment that is a moving target where we make the best decisions we can as opposed to really bad decisions that cripple things. Thanks, Sandy. If I could make another observation seen from Australia, when we look at America, we think that you've managed the, uh, the COVID terribly. But when we look at your uh, performance on the vaccine, we think it's been brilliant. And, uh, um, and somehow America's got its act together with a, maybe a strong state push. 
to get everyone vaccinated. And in Australia, it's the reverse. We've been brilliant at handling the pandemic, a very mm. low number of cases, a low number of deaths, and we've actually made a bit of a mess of the vaccination program. Well, how has America done so well on vaccination, whereas you did poorly in managing the, the virus in the outset? Uh, I think we had the idea of herd immunity, both sides of the political spectrum, right? Like herd immunity that everyone will get the virus and they will die or not die, right? There was that lieutenant governor in Texas who was like, I'll sacrifice my mother for, you know, and like, ah. So that was one culture mentality. And then the left is more like, you know, go science, we'll have the vaccine. But every, or the majority of Americans had a buy-in on this notion of herd mentality. And that is coming about through the vaccination process means people are really on board with that. And that, I think, largely contributed to its enthusiastic adoption implementation and otherwise, you know, fractious culture. Well, so I, I will add, I'll add uh, two cents to that, John. Uh, I was registered, I'm, I'm a diabetic, so I qualified as uh, the 1A phase in the U.S., one of the first people to get the vaccines after the, the medical community. Uh, I was registered on every, because I have a New York residency as well as a Pennsylvania residency, and I do so much work in Florida, I was registered on all three state web portals for getting my vaccine. My wife, who's a retired nurse, went back uh, uh, just as a charitable effort and registered with three pharmacies, gave them their insurance, uh, uh, current insurance, and said, I'm going to start vaccinating for you. And the amount of people that private pharmacies vaccinated in the first two and a half months in the U.S. was exponentially greater than any township, any state, any county, any pharmacy, large CVS, Walgreens kind of pharmacies. And she herself has administered 2,500 shots, 1,200 people she has vaccinated. There are tens of thousands of people like her that stepped up and said, we will go ahead and give these vaccines. And I got my first shot, uh, actually both my shots, at a private pharmacy where she was uh, administering vaccines. Why? Because they would get, uh, and I was 1A, I was qualified, I was a wait list. But they are the ones that were giving out of a vial of 10 vaccines, they would give six, there are four left. What do you do? You start calling on your wait list. But none of the pharmacies did that. The township didn't do that. Both my shots were already administered on me. And a month and a half later, I get notifications from New York, Florida, and Pennsylvania saying, hey, we can vaccinate you if you want. So in the U.S., a lot of uh, a smaller efforts stepped up, small pharmacies. And that's how very quickly a lot of people got vaccinated. The government yeah. sent out a lot of help uh, 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 from National Guard and every qualified medical professional within the National Guard started giving out vaccines for, for different states and counties. But that's how U.S. got the administration of it done so quickly before the big players stepped in. Yeah, West Virginia in particular was an excellent model of what Rog's describing. It was pretty fascinating to see the difference. In the I would say that when, when we measure the success of the U.S., we have to temper that thought. On the one hand, because of the wealth of the country, we were able to manufacture a lot of vaccines. And also, we had several companies that actually developed vaccines. And not only that, the mRNA was developed by the NIH, and that technology was used by Pfizer and Moderna. One of the great lessons of this, by the way, is in the African-American community in the U.S. that at times has a historical resistance to vaccination because of an historic set of injustices that were done and other reasons, perhaps. The fact that the mRNA technology was developed by a 30-ish year old, late 30s African-American doctor from North Carolina who grew up not wealthy in North Carolina, uh, 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 Dr. Kizmeka Corbett, who's now at the Harvard School of Public Health, is in fact a profile in courage and genius that should be basically sent to every student who is thinking about a career in science and even is not. On the other hand, the U.S. has politicized the sense that vaccines are necessary. We still have vaccine deniers, and I understand that. We have people who are hesitant because it is new, but we have a very large swath of this country that is anti-vaxxer, more than the old anti-vaxxer movement. Politics, I think, has increased resistance to vaccines. And that, in my opinion, is a harbinger of resistance to science and the truth. And I think that's problematic. Very interesting. Now we have about seven minutes left according to, to my clock. Uh, a quick comment about the, the way forward. I mean, how do we see the next year or two, starting with you, Andrew? By the way, should we ask for people who have their hands up if they have questions at all? 
Are there people with hands up? Yes. Where? In the room. Arun Amertham and Bernhard Bahofer. And Alec Wang and Charlie oh, Steinhead as well. Yeah, please. Do I click on the hand, is it? I think they take a microphone. Let's see if it works. Uh-huh. Arun, go for it. You've had your hand up for a long time, and you look like you do something very important. Arun? Alec Bernard? Wang? Alec? Or we can just continue, and unfortunately, we can ask them to email us their questions afterwards. Yeah, so Bernard, Alec, and Arun, if you do have questions or comments, please send them to uh, to us. Uh, if you don't have my email, you can just ask Frank. I'm going to put my email in the chat. Okay. And by the way, if Charlie Stein is on, I looked at your art. I would love to know more about it. Yeah, so any comments about sort of, you know, lessons, you know, the the future, the next year or two? Uh, Andrew? Yeah, I think Sanford's correct. There is a large contingency of the country that is against vaccines. And so there's a risk of it just being endemic in some capacity. Um, but I think that's going to combine with the digitization of work, right? Work is going to shift. People are now saying, hey, I don't want to commute anymore and things like that. So we're going to have a, I think a kind of, plus there's the problem of automation and joblessness that was a tidal wave of awfulness before the pandemic. Um, so I think that's all going to fuse together and we'll have this quasi isolated, somewhat skittish reality where we go through the trauma of the pandemic and also the trauma of increased automation while we search for the proper tools of innovation and employment uh, to guide us into the next phase. Um, I do think we are moving more towards a sense of social good and harmony, um, however small and kind of mitigated those steps are. And I'm personally working towards kind of efforts like universal basic income and things like that, because I do think you need these broad swaths to mitigate uh, the problems of transitioning to new eras. Thank you. Sandy. I, I think we just, as I say, I think we need to come out of this period with rethinking how we lead our lives, what we've learned from it. And I think everyone sitting around the dinner table or whatever group you're in and talking about what lessons you've learned, the things that you've uh, liked that you want to continue and the things that you don't like and how you're going to change them. Right. Harak, last word to you. So, John, unlike you, I'm not an economist, but I, I am impatiently waiting for the global economists uh, to kind of assess the outcome post COVID of what happened. My biggest fear, by the way, uh, is 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 not emotional. It's not societal. I think it's it's the effects of long COVID. The disease is not known yet to the science uh, community. They don't know what can happen six months down the road, a year down the road. Only time will tell. But I think from a people perspective, when the economists do their research, you'll be shocked to find out that that the stress level of people was not really as bad due to a lot of the social policies and and the community at large is going to come out more resilient out of this than weaker. Because if it's almost like saying if you lived through the 100-year event, you survived and, and, and you came out on the positive side of, of the equation at the other end, then, then you become more uh, resilient and, and, and a fighter that uh, I can do anything. Nothing can take me down. So I think that's what the broader uh, 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 notion out of this is going to be that I lived it and hence I can live anything else. Uh, but but the, 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 the fear on my part is the lack of understanding of the long COVID effect or what this this virus can and will do. Uh, uh, how, how much more will it mutate? I mean, they're saying that the, the, the Delta IV iteration or whatever it's called, the India variant, is significantly more damaging than, than the, the Wuhan or the, the UK or the South Africa variant. So uh, will, it, will it come up with something completely else that negates every vaccine? And maybe you are completely in the cycle of booster uh, shots and then, then life is still lost. And that might be the bigger fear than anything else. But that, that, at least that's my opinion long term in the next two years. I think on the economic side, we're going to see that resilience will prevail. And, and that'll be the winning hand. 
The one thing that I will say to that, because I think that's very wise, is that we need to double down and to actually want to know the answers. There are a lot of people who over the last several years did not want to know the answers. They just wanted to make believe that it would magically go away. The Washington Post had a column yesterday on the early research into the long-term neurological impact and what the activations were for the coronavirus on the neurological system, why it was causing brain issues, even with people with mild cases, mild cases or asymptomatic. Sometimes asymptomatic people months later would develop neurological, cardiovascular, or pulmonary problems, and that is an effect of the virus. And what we need to do is to actually understand science of what is going on as opposed to wish it away. Very interesting. I'll, we have one minute, so I'll make a couple of quick ones. Uh, I think that all this scientific research going into looking for uh, uh, vaccines and looking for cures for COVID may end up having lots of spin-off effects elsewhere in science, and it could well be uh, a boost to our scientific and technological uh, knowledge base. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is that uh, I think inequality is going to be a, more of an issue uh, in the future than it has been in the past. Inequality within our nations, between rich people and poor people who've been more affected, uh, between big companies and smaller companies, and also between rich countries and poorer countries. Poorer countries can't borrow as, as easily as richer countries. So inequality, I think, is a, a big issue coming out of this, or a bigger issue. And, of course, the impact of that on populism worldwide is something we have to perhaps worry about. You know, there are some people who say that the inequality coming out of the global financial crisis in 2008 ultimately led to populism and ultimately led to Donald Trump. So... You know, the politics of this could be interesting uh, looking ahead. Just a couple of comments. Friends, it was wonderful to spend this 45 minutes with you and to make new friends.